Welcome back to the Dope Show. You won't get sick of. I'm Spencer, and this is Sasha. Spent most of my twenties in federal prison, but I've been off heroin since April 9th, 2010. Got a lot of stories about the stupid stuff I did to get put in prison, and I've also got a lot of stories about the crazy stuff that happened when I was actually in prison. And God forbid you end up in prison, you want to make some of the same mistakes I made. So before I get started, being case, man, I'm so psyched. My ADD riddle, my thank you, buddy. He, he donated a couple dollars. I never ask anybody to, but if you do donate something, I am going to thank you for it. Goes in the junkie with a monkey fund. I've been talking about getting a little pet monkey, you know, with a little spinny cap and a tuxedo, maybe right on Sasha's back. But in more likelihood, uh, the money that has been donated will go to people that be interviewed. And as far as I know, Pinto is coming this Saturday. He does have a couple kids, uh, wife and kids, you know, uh, just getting over his sickness, everything else. It sounds like it. On my end, everything is up and running, but, you know, I can't control other people. And I, I've always got this self-doubt. It's like this lingering doubt that ah, something's going to happen. It ain't going to come down. But I have nothing to think that as of yet so anyway that's uh give him some gas money um let him come down here stay stay overnight and then drive back next day give him some walking money too just for being willing to do it um but anyway i have a unique set of life experiences that i've been through it allows me to talk about some stuff yeah you can go get some degree at some college and be a counselor, but if you hadn't lived life of addiction and stuff like that, it's kind of hard to relate to a lot of this stuff. Now, addicts typically use one drug. They'll get addicted to coke, smack, crack, speed, uh, whatever, and that'll be their set of experiences, the set of experiences within the addicts of that drug's lifestyle. Uh, me, I, I'd, I'd, you know, did the coke thing and then that didn't quite work out. Went to a Catholic school, went in, twagged out, so they think I was just a twitchy kid. That worked for about two weeks. Then I moved on to, you know, uh, pills. Then I moved on to opiates. I've, I've been pretty much, you know, an addict of each different type of drug and sold each different type. I typically use one and sell another. That's another thing. I did, there were times when, you know, given where I live, that I was a moderate to a higher level dealer. There are times I was just two-bit middleman. There was time where I allowed dealer to just live in my apartment in exchange for dope. So I've been on pretty much most ends of this type of thing. And this is one of those things that a lot of people might not know about. I was terrified, I still am, of needles. Terrified, terrified. Uh, when I was little, my mom and they'd have to pat me down before I went to the doctor because I'd bring a weapon with me in case they tried to stick me at that needle. I was going to bust them in the head with a toy truck or something from the time I was like four years old. That's how bad it was. Oh, God, press this. We all good, though. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, it, it's always been a fear, but, you know, addiction make you do crazy stuff you wouldn't guess you do. So I wasn't really on the needle as long as I was. You know, it, it wasn't really... For an extended period of time it was a shorter period of time of my addiction that i actually used the needle now this is all you know basically to let you know about the bad stuff that can happen this is one of the worst things that could ever happen oh god it was awful now i ended up living in this house on elm avenue which isn't too far from roanoke city i'll take y'all on a drive show you the actual house it's the only one with the fence it's across the street from southwest market for those of you who live in roanoke it's a blue little quick mark gas station i live literally within view of it in this duplex bottom floor uh ended up living in this house on bottom floor of with a couple guys i've been to this public rehab that no longer is open called src and you know <clears throat> they the one guy started back drinking and stuff and i saw where it was going and i was selling up at the whole time and you know just hiding it and everything and um you know i was basically like well i've got this and it was smack well they bought some of that. Next thing I know, they're cracked out and peeking at the windows, and we basically just had an absurd, insane living situation. The guy who it was in his name, he got like a retirement check for 6000 a month. His name was Frank, kind of like Frank off of Shameless, except he was Pakistani. Hairiest dude you've ever seen in your life, except the top of his head. Bald as could be on top of his head. But, like, he looked like Teen Wolf was trying to escape from 
from, if he's wearing a short sleeve, look like Team Wolf. Like hair was trying to escape out every which way, except for that top of his head was bald. And he's like a hippie dude. He's he's funny, you know, probably about fifty, sixty. But man, once he got once he got back on the smoking that stuff, he done moved a a, a, a street walker in with us, moved a prostitute in with us, introduced herself as my name is Chocolate Yo. And I'm like, oh, they call me Spencer, yo. Uh, she called herself Chocolate. She was white. Uh, wasn't bad looking girl, but she dressed like a, a like she was a, a kid getting ready to go shoot basketball down on the corner. Um, anyway, <laughs> crazy story with that. She's smoking up everything else. Took months of her moved in to this house that I'm living in. And Frank, I guess, making her his girlfriend or whatever. It's an odd situation for a fan that she's pregnant and smoking that stuff. That wasn't cool. But anyway, I wasn't using the needle as much, but there, I remember the first time this happened. There's something called cotton fever. I didn't know what it was. All I knew was when it started to happen. So when people use, uh, you know, IV drugs, they typically use a little piece of cotton. Some of those drugs get trapped in the cotton so after people you know draw it up and shoot it they'll put a little more water in there mix and match it around and then do it some more well there was a particular pill called Dilaudid and every time that did it, it this seemed to happen it, it happened a lot I guess because you keep on drawing that cotton and from what I understand it's like a little piece of tiny cotton gets drawn up in that needle and it ends up in your vein well nothing bad happened at first everything was completely normal Everything was completely normal for about 30, 45 minutes. And then I started shaking. My shaking got to work shaking like this. I remember I felt so dehydrated, like terribly dehydrated. We had some Kool-Aid in the fridge. I spilt all over the place getting it in this cup. was half full and shaking like this, and I couldn't even get it in my mouth. Got the worst headache I had in my life. Lasted for about four hours shaking like that, head hurting as bad as could be, whole body like seizing up of muscles and everything. It was it was awful. <clears throat> it was terrible. And it's a delayed fuse. So it's not like, you know, you just do what's called a rinse or wash of, you know, the original shot. It, it's something that happened hours, you know, up to hours later after it happened. There was one time that it happened like a couple hours later and I guess that little piece of cotton gets caught somewhere up in there. I don't know how it works. I don't know the science behind it. I know they call it cotton fever. And I know every time it happened was whenever I did rinses, which required drawing it back up in there off the cotton. And it's something that's awful that, you know, if you see somebody, you know, a lot of stuff I talk about, you know, is warm and everything else. But this was something, this was <sighs> treacherously terrible. I cannot explain how bad this hurt. Like, you know, my fiance, she she had seizures uh, when we first got together. I think they were stress induced. You know, from her ex, uh, she had them more often. She's only had one since we've been together, but it's a whole lot less stressful because you know, <laughs> I don't like doing the stuff they like doing, like using their hand. I'd never do that. You know, uh, whenever they get in an argument, I don't believe in that. I've never done it. We never will do it. Um, Worst thing we do is get mad and call each other a name, sit quiet for a few hours and look, and we'll be like, you done being an a-hole? You done being an a-hole? All right, we're back to normal. But anyway, she explains like after she has a seizure, it feels like she's been in a car wreck. Every muscle in her body hurts. It's about how this feels afterwards. It's like you had a seizure, but you don't go asleep. Like your whole body convulses just like you're having a seizure, but you're not asleep. It's my experience with it anyway. There have been a few times this has happened. One time I'd been out for a couple hours and I got home late. I had not done any more. It had been a couple hours. And then it happened again and I just laid there. It was just me uh, at the house and I laid, laid on the couch and it happened. I mean it's been over a decade ago but I mean it sticks in my head because it was, I can't explain it. First off, you, you throw, I threw up. I couldn't keep anything down. Felt dehydrated as could be. Um, dehydrated as could be. Couldn't drink anything, and the shaking and the just the season up. But the worst, the worst time that it ever happened. You know, 
I wasn't allowed to live at my mom's house as I shouldn't have been allowed. I had a little sister and I wanted to go run around doing hood rat stuff with my friends. Um, no, I'm joking, but it wasn't funny. But, you know, we still kept in contact. I'd go to certain things and stuff like that. And I believe my sister was a cheerleader at this particular time and my mom had picked me up and it had been a while since I had done this. But anyway, I got in the car, went with her to this school function and we left a little bit early and I felt it coming on and I was like, oh no, not now. And my mom had to sit in the car in the driver's seat next to me and um, I'm shaking and <clears throat> she's like, what's wrong? And I made it sound like I was going through withdrawals and that was just part of it, but it wasn't withdrawals. It was cotton fever and had to shake the whole ride home and tell her I'd be all right and convince her I'd be all right. And then she dropped me off and left. And it was just the most god awful, embarrassing thing and shameful thing you know I had to have happen in front of her. But that's part of what it is. I don't, I don't hold back, you know, on the stuff that I went through. I talk about the stuff as bad as it got because it's not bad today. And if it ain't bad today, you can talk about the stuff from before without being shamed or anything of it. I'm not shamed of it. I talk about this stuff so you guys can feel who have been through it, who are going through it, whatever can see. Okay, yeah, that happened. It's all good today though. And this was something awful. Now today it's a whole different generation with a whole bunch of different stuff. I mean, they're selling benzodiazepines that are counterfeit pills with fentanyl in them. That's not even the same feeling. I don't even understand that. How can you pass an opiate based pill off as a benzodiazepine. It's not the same feeling. So how do they do that? So I mean, it's just a whole different thing. It's not the same as it used to be, but the particular pill in which it happened the most frequently in my personal experience was one called Dilata, which is basically like the crack of opiates. It's a short acting pill. And um, every time I did, it had this, and like I'm saying, there's nothing glamorous about this. This is awful, you know, talking about this. Um, but it was that pill because Delonta hits like a freight train when injected. When taken orally, it doesn't. It, it hits, but it doesn't hit like that. When it is injected, there's this rush that'll drop you to your knees, your vision go half white, feels like somebody's squeezing your head, and it feels like warmth, and it feels like everything's going to be okay. Now, that rush only lasts like a few minutes. Like five minutes. Yeah, there's opi high that last after it, but there's this rush that hits hard, hard as can be. And it requires a whole lot of sticking yourself over and over again. So people will put another one, crushed up peel in the spoon and then run it through that cotton over and over again. And I'm guessing because of the frequent rinsing so once you do the peel you put more water in you mash up the cotton to get the rest of the drug that's trapped in the cotton out that the cotton's dislodged in some sort of way and a little piece of that cotton gets up that needle and ends up in your body traveling through your blood i mean i don't know the science behind it all i know is what happened afterwards i know they call it cotton fever and it makes sense because if you're repetitively mashing up the cotton drawing it back up putting it in you again and then this happens that makes sense to me that makes sense in how it happened oh my god the headache the headache you get from this is the worst headache you know that you could ever imagine and you can't eat you can't drink you throw up and you feel like you're gonna die of dehydration because you throw up and you can't hold down any fluids and you wonder when is this going to end and I wrote it out each time you know as I had did everything I wasn't one to ever call anybody I'd sit there and suffer in silence um, even when I was going through dope sickness a lot of the time I was one of those people that planned ahead like you know the people that use up everything and they wake up every morning sick then they go scouring around that was not me I'd usually have about three day to a week supply backstashed and unless something happened with the connection I had enough to pretty much cover me indefinitely as long as the connection was good whenever I ended up in that state of sickness once it got to that point the reason I kept it was because I don't know how people scoured and schemed and scammed stole deal whatever when they're going through that whenever I went through dope sickness I just lay there and just be like well it's here 
gonna have to deal with it now and I just lay lay there and deal with it and come off it a number of times it sucks every time um, it's not fun at all but um, you know same thing with this cotton fever thing when it hit I knew it when it happened I could feel it before it happened I could feel it coming on and then it just got to this shakiness when I say shakiness I don't mean I have a little spirit fingers tremble I mean like my whole body's doing this <clears throat> like that for four hours it is the most god awful thing that I do not know how to explain if you have not been through it. And like I said, I'm not a scientist. You know, I know a good bit about addiction. I know I know a good bit. Gone through about three and a half years of college, scattered about. And I haven't went enough to get a degree. It's scattered about time and everything else. Uh, and you know, substance abuse counseling or something like that. But from what I've learned through personal experiences and a good bit of book learning to um i know enough to help people um with certain stuff they've been through and a lot of the time the answers people want are not i mean are not what you're going to tell them the answers that you're going to give them that they need to hear are not the ones they want to hear and you know it's it's a matter of just the bad has to outweigh the good by such an extent that the addict realizes maybe this ain't working out for me for me that took uh being in jail for about a year before making bond uh it took me about five or six months and the whole five or six months i thought well, my tolerance has gone when i get out now i'm gonna get high for cheap well that's the most dangerous time i'd say about a quarter of the 44 friends i've had and uh, and i'd say the other couple hundred acquaintances who i don't know well the 44 i could name everybody in their family i could tell you childhood memories of about a quarter of them were released from a jail or a rehab went out, out tried to use around what they used to do and then passed one of them who um ended up dying they're not sure if he overdosed or if it, he got robbed he's the one who got robbed every other wednesday and then again on saturday he's the guy who i met at mcdonald's gave us all that money thousands and thousands of dollars didn't know us gave us the money my buddy wanted to rob him i said nah if he gave us this much he'll come back um and he didn't have any headlights in his car so we had to follow him home because he cried saying he's worried he's going to get in trouble we thought we were getting set up that guy okay after he got out of jail, I was in jail with him. He's about six foot, 120, 130 pounds. Did more than any human you've ever seen. I got up to a big tolerance. This six foot, 120, 130 pound guy was hustling so hard he had the excess amount. He warned a guy once at about 220, 230. Oh, don't do that much. You only, you only want to do one of these at most. And he's like, I just saw you do six, though. He says, yeah, that's me. You just want to do one. The guy did two. The guy fell out. They brought him back and everything else. But, you know, that's how addicted this guy was. When he got out of jail, he got up to 170 in jail. was fit, you know, healthy, doing good. I called him, checking on him, you know, and he was telling me, he was selling weed, this, this, and that, and told me that he had banged a th uh, Roxy 30 and that it nearly floored him. He said, I used to do... Uh, he said, I used to do four or five of those at a time. He says, I did one. He says, it about, about took me out. He says, I fell out. I said, yeah, man, you got to be careful. Um, he's not with us anymore. But anyway, yeah, the cotton fever thing's a, a weird thing. You don't hear it talked about too much outside the opiate community. Um, but, man, it's something awful. It, it's something I can't explain, but I'm sure... Uh, there's there's plenty of people on here that's heard of it before. It's a common term you've heard of it before, and I'd heard of it, you know, um, good many times since. But like when it whenever it first happened, I didn't know what was happening to me. You know, my body's convulsing, and I was like, but I'm not that messed up. What what's going on? <sighs> Rough. Anyway, Ben Case, thank you again, buddy. If you like the video, press the like button. If not, it's 19 minutes and 17 seconds of your life, and which you'll never get back. I'm going to work on getting that other channel set up today. I'm not slacking on any of this stuff, you know, work out and all the other stuff that's getting other channel, getting it ready for that. I'm working on that right now. I'm going to do a video for that one uh, that'll go on that one because you got to have one in order to start a channel. So just be pretty much just like an introduction type thing starting but that will allow me to do what i do here with the prison stuff and then usually an addiction related thing if i do a second one in a day on this channel and then on the other one i'll do all the extra stuff so if you liked it press the like button um i'll mention that other channel 
this evening. Um, gotta think of something. I'm gonna call it something clever or stupid or cleverly stupid. Something you remember. <laughs> something people can click on. You know, some people come up with names for channels and they're pretty cool names, but if you search their name in a YouTube search button, you have to go through 40, 50 videos just to find them. If you type in their exact YouTube name, the Dope Sick Show, you're, you're not going to have too hard of a time finding that if you type it in a search button. You know, it's that's pretty simple. So I liked it to be something, you know, if you can type it, you can find it. There's too many things that are too much the same, you know. So, But anyway, hope you like the video.